Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, so we're having unexpected uh, technical difficulties. We tested the setup uh, something like uh, one hour ago, and it was working. Uh, so we're going to change the order of the speakers. Uh, we're going to hear uh, Nicolas Usunier. So um, uh, Nicolas Usunier is uh, a maître conférence at uh, Université de Technologie de Compiègne, where he has a, a, he holds a, a shared excellence. Um, he's done uh, research on uh, several topics. Uh, he's worked quite a bit on uh, information retrieval, and more particularly on, on ranking, where he, he proposed both uh, applied and uh, theoretical results. Um, and he's worked on the kind of topic that he's going to talk about today, which is about um, extracting information about relations uh, in data and semantics. Okay. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, so, uh, sorry for the long title. Uh, basically, the talk will be about um, learning vectors from uh, highly structured and symbolic data so that we can uh, actually use machine learning on that. So, uh, the first part, uh, in the first part of the talk, I will uh, present what I call the open domain relational data, which basically are also called knowledge bases, and I will uh, motivate why these uh, kind of new resources are important and why they, uh, they are interesting uh, for machine learning and why they are an inter interesting problem of, uh, say, big data, big data as well. Uh, then I will present what, what I call learning vector representations for, from knowledge bases and then uh, our approach and, uh, and some application to uh, link prediction uh, in, uh, in these knowledge bases and uh, information extraction. So uh, we all know that uh, today with the web we have a lot of uh, relational data, uh, so entities that are linked together uh, according to a specific relationship. Uh, for instance, in social network we have entities which can be uh, people, web pages, posts, uh, and all of these entities can be linked uh, together, uh, such as people can be friends, uh, people can comment uh, on uh, a post of someone else, or people can like uh, a web page or something like that. Uh, in recommendation or advertising, we also have, uh, say, linked data uh, between users and products. Uh, a user can purchase a product, can visit the, page, the web page of a product, or uh, simply rate a product. So uh, these relational data, uh, basically they take the form of a huge set of triples, uh, either subject, predicate, object, or head label tail. Uh, that, uh, so the head is the first entity, the label is the kind of relationship that links these entities, and uh, tail is uh, the next one, the, the last entity. So I will be interested in, uh, say, open domain relational data, and especially uh, knowledge bases. So knowledge bases are uh, a set of entities or concepts without restriction of domain, which are described uh, by their relations with other entities. So typically there is uh, Freebase or DBpedia, which, uh, so Freebase is a subset of the Google Knowledge Graph and it's seeded from uh, automatic extraction from Wikipedia. And uh, it's basically a set of uh, entities, so started with like uh, Wik Wikipedia topics, but now it contains uh, any kind of music tracks, uh, artists, movies, celebrities, countries, and essentially everything. Uh, it contains 43 million entities, so 43 million topics, which are linked together by uh, more than 23,000 relationships. So in this kind of data, uh, we are not talking about, say, social networks where we, we may have 10, 10 kind of links between people and objects. Here we have 23,000 kind of links, which may be kind of uh, capital, from capital off to uh, anything uh, between uh, any, kind of, uh, any kind of entity. Uh, and so it's huge and it's collaboratively annotated and that's why it's, uh, it keeps on growing. And uh, so as of yesterday, it contains 2.4 uh, billion facts. So 2.4, uh, say, triples that link entities uh, with each other. So uh, there is another kind of 
uh, open domain uh, relational data, which looks like a knowledge base, but is not exactly a knowledge base. Uh, I take the example of reverb. So it's uh, triples that uh, take the form of subject, verbal, phrase, object, which are automatically extracted from text according to some templates. And uh, so they, uh, the people ran that uh, on free text, uh, a huge amount of text. And they can uh, extract links which somehow represent uh, common sense knowledge or uh, general facts. Uh, so it's not exactly a knowledge base because uh, the facts that are extracted from the text are not authenticated. So there are, nobody checks that they, these correspond to uh, the actual truth. But still, uh, they give us information uh, which can be uh, descriptive of, uh, say, everyday knowledge. And so, likewise, in this kind of, uh, in this kind of data, uh, what is striking is the number of relationships. So this kind of open domain uh, relational data, uh, the number of relationships compared to the number of entities or the number of facts is huge. Okay, so uh, these uh, knowledge bases are, uh, offer a lot of new opportunities because uh, they represent, say, a machine learning, uh, a machine friendly storage of the factual knowledge that can be present on the web or anything else. And in particular, one of the vision uh, behind the creation of these knowledge bases is basically the next gener generation of question answering systems or retrieval systems. Uh, for instance, if you have someone who asks the questions, which painkiller don't have any side effect on the stomach, uh, it's typically the kind of questions that uh, possibly no single web page can answer that. But if you have a knowledge base which uh, kind of has collected uh, information on different medicine uh, on different uh, web pages, uh, then uh, the knowledge base which structures uh, and aggregates uh, all the knowledge extracted, you can answer the, the question. Uh, but also, uh, since they provide uh, huge uh, and very rich descriptions of entities, uh, the knowledge bases may also be used uh, as input, so as content, content descriptors uh, of the entities to be used in other tasks. So for instance, uh, we may uh, use the, the information about the entities for better text comprehension. So uh, for instance, for word sense disambiguation, because we will have features about the different entities, even if they are represented by the same name. Uh, so, or entity resolution. But also uh, for recommendation, uh, we can uh, actually uh, use the content and descriptions of music, uh, products, and everything that is present in these knowledge bases, and uh, use that uh, in conjunction with uh, ratings or purchase data. In addition to that, uh, there is uh, what I call the virtual uh, circle. So basically the idea is that uh, a knowledge base, uh, the more information and the more facts there is in it, uh, and the more usable it is, okay? Now, uh, in order to uh, include new facts in, in the knowledge base, we actually need uh, some input, and one way of getting some input is actually to extract the knowledge from text. Uh, and then, uh, when we have a knowledge base, we can also uh, try to capture some patterns in the knowledge base and make link prediction to actually infer some kind of likeliness or likelihood of a new fact, okay? And the virtual cycle is basically that as uh, the KB becomes more and more complete, uh, complete then uh, our link prediction algorithm may be more and more precise, and then it will help the information extraction engine to actually uh, have a better confidence on what it uh, extracts and on, what, on how uh, the facts are uh, included in the, in, in the knowledge base. And so uh, the rest uh, of the talk will basically be about uh, link prediction in knowledge bases and uh, the interaction with uh, information extraction. So now, uh, the knowledge bases are intended to be machine friendly in the sense that they can be queried very easily. But the point is that machine friendly doesn't mean that uh, we can use machine learning easily from that data. 
And uh, basically because learning algorithm usually requires similarities, and these similarities are often inferred from a feature vector. But uh, by definition, somehow, uh, in these knowledge bases, all of this uh, description of the objects is contained uh, by the relations between the entities. So basically, the intrinsic properties of the objects are defined by the links. And so uh, in these, uh, say, knowledge bases, uh, what usually corresponds to features are now relationships, so types of relations. And what usually corresponds to feature values are now uh, entities themselves. Okay, and entities themselves have relationships, have feature values. And so we have some kind of uh, recursive description of the objects. And obviously, uh, by definition, many values may be missing. Uh, potentially, it's incorrect if it's uh, performed by a human. So uh, we need to find a way uh, to actually use that data efficiently in a learning algorithm. So the goal of this work uh, is to learn uh, structure-preserving vector representations. So as I just said, uh, in order to work with the information contained uh, in the data, we need somehow to uh, be able to represent the entities as vectors. And so uh, the problem that I will address is to uh, map uh, the entities into a vector space, say a small dimensional vector space, and to interpret relations between entities as functions on these vectors so that uh, we can, given the vectors of the entities, recover the links in the data set. And then uh, we can interpret the feature vectors, so these uh, embeddings, as uh, basically descrip descriptions of the entities because they contain the information about the relations and thus, they contain uh, the descriptive information of the entities. So uh, actually, this kind of data is uh, very particular because we obviously have a large number of entities, but um, say 43 million entities is not that huge. Uh, but we also have a very, very large number of relationships. And uh, the data grows uh, along its three dimensions, which are the entities, the relationships, and the facts. And actually, uh, it grows uh, with entities and relationships much faster than the facts. So for instance, if we, if we can take extract from Freebase, if we take, say, uh, the top uh, 15,000 entities, then we get basically uh, 10 to the power minus 5% of, uh, say, all possible relationships that are non-zero, uh, given the number of facts that we have. But if we uh, try to get more data, then uh, we actually capture entities with less links. We capture relations which, are less, uh, which have less uh, impact on the data. And we get, on average, less facts per entity and, and per relations. And the problem becomes dramatically sparse. And so actually, even if we are kind in a huge scale problem, uh, actually, uh, since we want to reason uh, at the level of each individual entity or each individ individual relation, uh, then we actually have problems of learning with few examples because we end up with, relations, uh, with relationships with very few positive examples and with many entities which are not links that much with other entities. Okay, so uh, for this kind of problem, uh, basically with very sparse data, it happened uh, a lot in, uh, say, collaborative filtering or uh, Netflix-like data. And so uh, one possible way or one first way uh, to deal with that is uh, to extend or to use extensions of a matrix factorization algorithm and to use tensor factorization algorithm. So we can represent the whole data as a tensor. So uh, say the, all of the, the adjacency matrix uh, matrices of all the relationships are stacked one after the other. So if we have, say, P relationships, we have P matrices stacked. And uh, we can, so the, the RESCAL algorithm, which is basically one of the basic algorithms to learn uh, such embeddings, say, 
uh, is to, to approximate the tensor, which uh, contains one if there is a relation, if uh, a relation is present, and zero if it is absent. Uh, basically, by a product of uh, one matrix A, which uh, has one row per entity, and then uh, one matrix RK by uh, relation. And basically, this corresponds to uh, something which is called uh, collective matrix factorization. So it boils down to uh, factorizing each uh, ad adjacency matrix of each relation, but by sharing some factors uh, which represent the entities. And so uh, in this algorithm, uh, the learning is carried out by uh, just uh, trying to fit uh, the, the, ba the basic data. Uh, according to a squared norm. And generally, uh, so there are a lot of uh, algorithms in, in the state of the art uh, about tensor factorization or collective factorizations uh, or more uh, algorithm more specific uh, to, uh, say, knowledge bases. But uh, what is important in, this, in the state of the art is that there has been a high, uh, very good focus on having high expressivity and generosity for the models so that they can be applied to essentially any kind of, uh, say, uh, multi-relational data. But our observation on knowledge-based data is that uh, when we have a model that is too expressive, then uh, we rapidly fall into a high overfitting. And it turns out that uh, the standard tricks for regularization do not seem to work well. So our approach is basically uh, to take uh, another, another approach. And the idea is, instead of trying to have models uh, which can actually uh, represent uh, highly complex uh, structural patterns in the data, to actually try to reduce the expressivity of the model to avoid overfitting and to be able to actually generalize and uh, correctly make a link prediction. But uh, when we reduce um, expressivity, then we need to find a, par a parameterization which is suitable for the kind of relationship that we actually want to model. So we, we need to find a parameterization which will work well uh, on data which is uh, knowledge basis. So uh, the idea, uh, what we propose here is to model uh, relationships uh, by translations, okay? I will uh, give intuition and motivation for that uh, later. But uh, the idea is that we will project each entity into a vector of low dimension and say that whenever we have a fact like Molière is born in Paris, then uh, to the relationship born in, there is a translation vector which should uh, map Molière to something close to Paris. And in particular, Paris should be closer to the translated vector than another city, which is not the, the answer. So just uh, to look at uh, a little pictorial uh, visualization of what the translation makes. So uh, basically, if we have uh, here uh, the, the embeddings in two dimension, so we take evergreen, we translate into uh, according to the translation vector, which corresponds to the uh, relation. Okay. And we take the nearest neighbor, which is here, Paris. And we can do that on this example, essentially for uh, any uh, left member of Bornin. For another relationship, then it will be another translation, but still the same translation for uh, every entity, and we take the nearest neighbors. And uh, we can find a relation, uh, a translation vector for each relationship. Uh, so obviously this example may seem a little, uh, say, artificial, uh, but so let me explain why uh, we can believe that uh, translations are actually a good way to model relationships uh, in knowledge bases. So uh, the first motivation is uh, the ability to, uh, for uh, translations to model one-to-one -one relationships. And so uh, the people at Google, uh, in the context of learning embeddings of words uh, from text. So learning embeddings of words from text uh, simply means that um, given a sentence, we take a word and we want to predict the surrounding word uh, through a dot product between uh, word vectors. 
and uh, the goal is to learn these vectors. And what they actually observed is that uh, once they have learned, uh, learned their low dimensional representations of their vectors, uh, if, they, for, if, for instance, they take the vector uh, which represents Paris and they subtract it to France and they add Italy, then the nearest neighbor is actually Rome. And if they put Japan instead of Italy, then they get Tokyo uh, with the nearest neighbor. And so uh, what it means is that it, they are, it was actually an observation. They didn't intend that. Uh, but what it means is that Paris minus France here actually plays the role of a translation for uh, the relationship capital of. So uh, in their data, they don't have the relationships. But um, it turns out that in some one-to-one -one relationships, so uh, like capital of or uh, president of, uh, we can actually, there seems to be embedding spaces where we can model these kind of relationships uh, with translations. And the second motivation for translation is uh, to be able to model hierarchical relationships. And so, for instance, if you take a relationship which is tree structured such as, uh, say, father of, uh, and let's say we take the natural 2D embedding uh, of the tree, so it's just basically the, the drawing. Uh, so each cross here represents an entity and there is an edge uh, between two entities if one is the father of the other. Then uh, actually the relationship father of uh, can always be recovered with a single translation vector and uh, a nearest neighbor search. And basically, the idea is that when we talk about knowledge bases, uh, most of the relationships that uh, we actually want to model are either, um, say, one-to-one uh, -one relationships, born in capital of or something like that, but also hierarchical relationships, maybe others, but uh, statistically, it turns out that uh, this kind of relationships uh, is very important. So just to give uh, some uh, hints about how uh, training and testing is done. So uh, we consider that the training set is uh, a set of triples which, corresponds to, which correspond to true facts. Uh, so head, label, tail. Head and tail uh, correspond to entities and we will learn one embedding per, per entity. And uh, we will learn one translation vector per uh, relation. So the parameters are basically all uh, the possible values for the features of the embeddings. And we will learn uh, these values uh, uh, so that the constraints, uh, the nearest neighbor constraints are satisfied. And we'll try to make two kinds of tests. Uh, the first one is to predict, is basically linked prediction, so predict uh, new facts, uh, which are true. And uh, the second test is uh, to predict new facts, but for new relationships with your examples. Because as, as, we, as we said, uh, one of the problems is that uh, with the models, uh, we get, uh, as we get more and more data, we get more relationships with very few uh, examples per relationship. And uh, this is a bottleneck of uh, most existing methods. So uh, just a quick review of the training criterion. Uh, so it's basically a ranking criterion where we want uh, incorrect triples to be uh, the, the, the distance uh, between the translation subject uh, with the wrong object, uh, we want it to be greater than uh, the distance between the true object and uh, the true translated subject. So uh, basically we use uh, a ranking criterion, which means that um, we want uh, for each triple uh, the distance between translation subject and object to be small. And uh, so this kind of uh, pairwise criterion, uh, we can see that if we want to minimize it, then uh, it will uh, make sure that uh, the, when we learn the embeddings, uh, then the distance uh, between uh, the, say, the translated, uh, the translated subject and the object will be small when the triple is correct, and otherwise it will be large. Okay, and uh, the hyperparameters here are uh, the margin, uh, the dimension of the embeddings, and uh, the dissimilarity function, which may be uh, the one norm, the two norm, of the, or the square two norm. Um, how we carry on the optimization here is uh, with stochastic gradient descent, and uh, actually we are pretty sure 
uh, there is a lot of improvements that can be done on this part. But anyway, uh, it seems to work. Uh, the idea here is uh, we perform stochastic gradient descent where at each step we sample a positive triple and one of its corrupted triple. And we update the, the parameters according to uh, the gradient of the loss function corresponding to only uh, that pair. And uh, we maintain uh, the regularization constraints here, the, uh, the fact that the norms uh, of the embeddings should be, not be greater than one uh, by projecting the, the embeddings into the M2 unit ball. And uh, we use early stopping uh, as a stopping criterion so that we actually never compute the full uh, objective function because just computing the objective function is, is essentially impossible. So uh, we'll have uh, two data sets for uh, making link prediction. So one small extract from Freebase with uh, 15,000 entities and uh, 1,300 relationships and uh, a big Freebase with 1 million entities. And just to give uh, indicative training times, uh, for instance, to train on uh, 1 million entities, it takes about 20, 24 hours on 16 CPUs. So just to give an example of what kind of prediction we can make, so uh, the question we want to answer, the kind of questions we want to answer uh, about is, for instance, the film wall E, uh, what kind of genre it, it has. Uh, so here, the green uh, ones are uh, the genres that are present uh, for training. The blue one is the one uh, which is for the test triple, which is true, and the black ones are the, uh, the other answers of the system, but which are neither on the, in the train nor in the test. So actually, uh, animation, computer animation, seems uh, rather true, even though they are not present in the, in the database. OK, so um, just uh, for the basic uh, link prediction results. So the test results, uh, we, we compare with three algorithms uh, from the state of the art. And actually, it turns out that uh, our model, even though it is uh, much simpler uh, and actually uh, uh, with uh, much less expressivity than all other models, uh, it has uh, an extremely good uh, performance, uh, specifically on this uh, knowledge base data. And in particular, with uh, Freebase 1 million, uh, we, have, we find uh, the correct uh, missing link uh, in the top 10 ranked uh, objects uh, for more than 34% of the time. So we rank 1 million entities, but in the top 10 entities, uh, we find the answer 34% of the time. And so uh, here uh, are the results for learning uh, new relationships. So here, we first learn the, uh, the embeddings of the entities. Uh, we fix them, and then we try to learn new relationships and to add them uh, in, uh, so we, we just learn the translation vectors of the entities, uh, of the relationships. Uh, and so uh, the purple curve here uh, is our model, and uh, as expected, uh, it learns uh, pretty much faster uh, with the number of training triples than the other models. Okay, so uh, just a quick uh, review of an application to open domain uh, relation extraction. So uh, the goal of uh, open domain uh, information extraction is uh, to identify new facts to add them uh, from, to the knowledge base. So the idea is that given a text mention that we find uh, just in plain text, in classical unstructured text, uh, we assume that uh, the, ent the, the entities that are referred to in the text and which correspond to free base entities uh, have been identified. Okay, so uh, this can be done with the name, the entity tagger, and uh, just string matching uh, between uh, references. And then uh, the question that we need to answer is, uh, is there uh, a relationship between the two entities? Or what I mean is, does this sentence uh, bring us information that we didn't know uh, about uh, some, relationship be some relation between Alfred Hitchcock and the birds? And here it's a uh, director of that we need to predict. So. Uh, Classically, uh, this kind of problem is uh, dealt with only by just uh, taking uh, the head and uh, the tail entities that have been uh, seen in the text, as well as the text mentioned, so just uh, the, the sequence of words, 
and then to uh, train a multi-class classifier to predict what kind of relation this text uh, is about. Okay. So uh, our approach is uh, simply to use the scores predicted uh, by the link prediction algorithm from uh, the, the previous model and just add them uh, to the scores uh, uh, of the text to actually alter and modify the confidence that we can have uh, in our estimation of the relation. So the idea is that uh, if, uh, given the knowledge base and uh, the two entities that have been detected, then uh, the link prediction algorithm uh, says that uh, it's very unlikely that there is a, a link between these two entities, then we can discard uh, any kind of prediction. And so uh, it's actually a very, very simple way to include uh, knowledge-based data uh, in information extraction. It almost costs nothing. And um, so actually, the test results here. So uh, the black curve is uh, the joint model uh, between uh, the text and the addition of the, knowledge base, uh, the, the information of the knowledge base. And uh, the red curve here is the model text only that we used and all others are state of the art. And this is a precision recall curve, so the higher the better. And uh, what we see is that the introduction of uh, the information given by the link prediction algorithm uh, is able to actually uh, improve the confidence that we have uh, in the relations we extract. Okay, so uh, in conclusion, uh, we showed that uh, learning the embeddies, uh, embeddings of the entities of knowledge bases allows to efficiently perform inference, link prediction, and information extraction. Something that uh, I would like to say is that we are clearly still at the infancy of such methods, and essentially we gain uh, like 10% uh, performance uh, each year, uh, these years. So it's basically that uh, we still don't fully understand what's going on in there. And uh, so there, there are obviously a lot of applica applicative perspectives and essentially uh, linking uh, knowledge bases and text uh, in a uh, closer way than uh, just uh, adding the, the two terms as we did for information extractions. And there are obvious uh, open issues in machine learning, uh, which is learning with very sparse data. Uh, clearly, regularization in uh, such, uh, say, tensor models uh, is a big issue here. And uh, optimization is a big issue as well. So thank you very much. Do you want to set up while we take a couple of questions? So are there questions? Yes, so I can see a question over there at the back. I was wondering, can you explain to me what uh, hit at 10% is? Oh, the, the measure hits at 10? Yes. Yes, uh, okay, so uh, the kind of question, the, the kind of question we want to answer is that we have, uh, for instance, wall E has genre, and uh, we have one slot that is empty, and we want to fill in that slot. Weird, eh? Uh, okay, so we have, tri the basic idea is that we have triples. And uh, so for testing, we remove one of the terms of the triple and uh, we rank all possible entities according to their likeliness of being at this slot of the triple. Okay, and so uh, the hits at 10 means that uh, whether the good triple, the, the, whether the, the entity that we uh, uh, hide uh, is in the top 10 of this ranking. Hello. Uh, how do you deal with new entities for which you don't know the embedding? Uh, so, um, for now, we don't. Uh, so, 
basically, uh, if we want to include new entities, we, would, we should do the same kind of uh, things that we did with uh, the new relationships. So basically, uh, an entity in isolation, uh, in any way, uh, has no information with a knowledge base. So for a new entity, we can only add it when it starts to be linked with other entities. And so uh, we, we should uh, just do as we did for uh, new relations. We fix all other embeddings, and we optimize only on the embeddings of this new entity. Any other questions? Uh, just a, a very quick remark. Uh, first, thank you for a great talk. Um, I just want to make, I just want to say that the issue of embedding objects is uh, is one of, of great interest uh, you know by companies like Facebook and Google and just about everybody because you can use this for all kinds of different things and you could sort of uh, in, in a shorthand if you wanted to say what we're trying to do at Facebook AI research is to basically embed the world if you want and in fact uh, a lot of the people you mentioned in your in your in your uh, in your talk Jason Weston Antoine Bord and uh, Tomasz Mikolov are all working at Facebook AI research now so that was just a short plug thanks All right, we should probably move on. Sorry for remaining questions.